often. But this meeting is recorded. I do this pretty often. I, I, I just tell her my talks that I've given to professional audiences to the pep pioneers. And I can do that because you guys are pretty sophisticated. You've had a lot of information about pulmonary rehabilitation. So I don't have to uh, go back to ground zero in order to get you up to speed. Uh, some of the words, uh, I take some of the 50 cent words and, and shorten them a little bit. But otherwise, I think that the, the concepts are, are pretty much uh, translatable. The other thing that I, I, I would offer is that, um, so what's the other thing I'd, I'd offer? Is that you guys are the lucky ones. You've had pulmonary rehabilitation. <coughs> I say that to the vast majority of people who have lung disease. And again, I, I think you should be grateful to the folks at the uh, little company, Mary, uh, who have produced a really, really excellent program over the last, what is it now, 40 years or so. Uh, it, it, somebody mentioned that I'm from L LA Biomed. That's an old name. It's now the Lundquist Institute because the Lundquist gave the institution about $75 million. So wow. we, call, we call it Lundquist Institute now, but it's the same place at Harbor, U near ha Harbor UCLA County Hospital, but we do a lot of research we have a very nice research building, and uh, a lot of you have come and participated in clinical trials, and a lot of the historical PEP pioneers have been some participants, some really uh, very important uh, research studies. So let me let me see what I what I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, Mike, uh, let me go back even further than uh, when I started with the PEP pioneers, and talk about the the roots of pulmonary rehabilitation. This is the man who I would call the grandfather of pulmonary rehabilitation. Alvin Baraki practiced in New York City. Uh, you can see he lived from 1895 to 1977. He was a, an amazing individual. You should know his name. It's really sort of, sort of, a, a, sort of good. He, starting in 1922, he started treating people with oxygen. Uh, very uncommon before, before that. Uh, Heliox, another way of letting people breathe better. I had thought that would have started in the 1970s or 80s, but no, he was using it in 1934. He was in the early studies of penicillin, the first antibiotic uh, in 1945. Imagine how exciting that must have been. Um, portable <coughs> oxygen supplies, that's starting to get closer to home, developed these things in 1950s. He said an oxygen cane that his, uh, his son told me, they he stole the doorknobs off the doors in the house to create these canes that carried um, oxygen supplies on the little small, small tanks <laughs> canes. Um, he published a lot, um, despite the fact that PubMed didn't start in the mid 1990s. It still lists, lists 164 publications, several books. I have a couple of his books uh, published up to the year that he, that he died. Really a remarkable individual. But here's what, why uh, he's important to us. This is from 1952. He talked about people with pulmonary emphysema. That's what we call COPD now. So an exercise program was instituted with subsequent marked improvement in capacity to, to do exercise. The ability, the progressive improvement in ability to walk without shortness of breath suggested a physiological response. The body had changed to adapt to it, similar to a training program that you do in healthy people. Now, up to this point, they said, well, if you're short of breath, stop doing what's making you short of breath. Here he's saying that exercise can be good for people with a lung disease. Uh, this is a quote from a little bit later. When I see somebody whose pulse rate going back and forth reaches 140, a high level, it's evident he hasn't walked enough to maintain cardiovascular efficiency. Maybe unusual perhaps to suggest these breathless people, but the fact is that one of the ways they can restore physical fitness I'm unhappy about patients who use an elevator to go upstairs. I sound like, like Jackie yelling at you, don't use an elevator, walk up the stairs. From now on, practice walking up the stairs, breathing oxygen. The muscles in their legs of these people are very often atrophied. The muscles aren't doing well in the legs and you fix those and things get better. So this is, the, this is like the grandfather of rehabilitation. Here's the father of pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, Dr. Tom Petty, who I, I knew very well, who was a very good friend of uh, the, the PEP pioneers and Little Company and Mary program, uh, operated out of Denver uh, almost all of his professional career, died in 2009. He was the first one to establish an organized pulmonary rehabilitation program in 1966. 
he established a program that looks somewhat, well, pretty much like the program that, that you guys went through. He published his work in 1969. He didn't call it pulmonary rehabilitation, a comprehensive care program for chronic airway flow obstruction, but this is pulmonary rehabilitation. Space forward a couple of years, and here's Mary Burns, who I think is on the call today, who established the uh, the, the, the Little Columbia Mary program. Uh, she was an ICU nurse who sort of uh, got the bug and, and uh, started the rehabilitation program, who organized programs and put them in community hospitals and exposed a lot of people to them. Um, found novel ways to motivate patients, added components to enrich pulmonary rehabilitation. A long history of contribution for Mary Burns. We sort of came in, our, our group came in in the late 1980s, and this is a paper from the early 1990s, where we said, look, we can do rehabilitation, but let's try to figure out how to best do it, especially as regards how to make, have people exercise and whether in fact it really does benefit from them, makes their, makes their bodies work better rather than just sort of a psychological <laughs> benefit. And we published this paper in, uh, two, in 1991 that showed in fact that if you do rehabilitation and you do it afterwards, you for a given level of, of exercise, you need to breathe less. And, and that's, that's very important. That's, that's what makes you feel bad. You need to breathe less for a given amount of exercise. And that's a physiologic benefit. A, you've changed the organism, you've changed your muscles and your body's function so you can, you can tolerate uh, things better. That's how rehabilitation works. This paper has been cited, it was a small study, but it's been cited over 1,100 other papers and cited this as being important, important information. We moved on to sort of consider um, how rehabilitation helps people. I think this, the model for this, uh, this figure was a pet pioneer, uh, how muscles get better and lo the lungs or the load are is taken off the lungs, how you're less anxious and depressed, how the, your brain adapts to the sensation of dyspnea and went on to publish some uh, really good studies. This is a very large group we brought together on the muscle, the muscles of the legs being not working well, uh, how we can fix them and, um, uh, and what therapies we can use. This has been updated in 2014. This is a group that, that we brought together to do this. Um, so what does rehabilitation do? It, unequivocal benefits that you can do more after rehabilitation program, you can exercise more, that you're less short of breath, especially short of breath during exercise, and your quality of life in general improves with rehabilitation. Not only does it do this, but it does this better than any other therapy we have for COPD. It works better than Spiriva, better than Ultibron, better than all the bronchodilators you take. It works better, a larger order of magnitude than any of these other uh, therapies. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of hype a, a study we, we, we uh, <clears throat> recently, a very large database looking at how much longer people could exercise if they received either rehabilitation or a good bronchodilator. And for people with mild COPD, moderate COPD, severe COPD, or very severe COPD, you can see that the bronchodilator doesn't work very well for people with lower levels of COPD, but pretty well for, for greater ones. But rehabilitation, that's the red bars, it works for everybody. Everybody benefits from rehabilitation, whether you have mild uh, COPD or severe COPD. It does other things too. Um, it decreases the, the number of flare-ups you get uh, from, from COPD. It reduces uh, depression and anxiety, makes you feel better, uh, works better than pills to, to decrease uh, depression improves your thinking uh, processes. And it probably makes you adhere to your other drugs better. You understand your drugs and you take them, take them better. All these are important things. So let, let me get to that. That's the background. Let me get to the sort of major points, the promise and the problem we have with rehabilitation. And first the promise, well, are there other things beyond what I've already uh, gone, gone through that we can cite. Can somebody uh, mute themselves, please? Uh, it, it, it's showing up. I want you to hear me. Somebody, somebody's got a radio or talking in the background. 
Maybe I can try and mute everybody. You'll probably mute me too. Usually mutes the someone. Yeah, just everybody mute yourself, please. Okay, I'll, I'll go on. That's not, not all that bad. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, well, what additional benefits might there be? What can where can we go? Is there more? Well, one thing is this pulmonary rehabilitation making you live longer. It may not be the only thing you want to do, but wouldn't we all like to live longer in, in good health? Therapies that improve mortality have a high priority. People, if you say, well, here's a therapy and it will make you live longer, but I'm not going to give it to you. Well, that's not really acceptable. So let's see if we can see if pulmonary rehabilitation improves longevity. How would we go about proving this? Well, it's not very easy, actually. And we tried to do this. This is actually the second iteration. Uh, we did this in uh, 10 or 12 years ago. We tried this again about three years ago to put together a study. And in here, you see a guy named Barry Make from uh, Colorado, Jerry Christian from Chicago. And this old guy here, we pulled together a group of people and said, let's see if we can design a study. We called it Propel to see whether pulmonary rehabilitation would improve mortality of people who are being hospitalized for COPD and then, and then would receive rehabilitation or not. And we designed this study. First of all, it needed 2,000 people to participate. And we would have to get about 20 different sites around the country to do this. And we would have to follow these people after they got rehabilitation or not for about two years. And we were going to figure out whether this was cost effective and stuff like that. We submitted this proposal to the, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, and said, here's a study we really need to do because we really need to know this answer. And we said, oh, incidentally, it's going to cost $30 million to do this in about seven years to do it. And they said, no. Well, I don't know why not. I don't know why not. Well, other things got funded, but we tried, we tried, we tried. We couldn't get, couldn't get this study funded. So we, in fact, don't know. I think by now we would more or less have the answer if they had funded it, but, but we couldn't get it funded. So we sort of uh, tail between our legs and sort of slunk away. Well, it turned out in the meantime, there was an alternate approach. And this is a guy named Peter Lindenauer, uh, works out of a, a hospital in Boston. He's the master of the electronic medical records. You know, now that, now, nowadays when you, when you have a Medicare and stuff like that, a lot of stuff gets encoded in it. And Peter was able to, to look at this and other people are able to look at this stuff, not with, with your name removed, not who, we, who you are, but the kind of care you've received and the kind of responses you've had. And this paper was, was published in, the, in 2020 and is actually quite important. What he was able to do is to take the medical records of 197,000 people who were Medicare beneficiaries who were hospitalized for COPD in 2014 and compared their mortality, the mortality of those who either got rehabilitation in the first three months after discharge or didn't. And let's see which group lived longer. Well, what he found was that people who participated in pulmonary rehabilitation had a 37% lower risk of dying. And if you graph it out, you see this, this graph here, and this is the, the, the percent of people who died within 90 days who received rehabilitation within 90 days, and those after 90 days, or most of them, not at all. And you can see that's pretty, I'd much rather be in this group than this group, right? So rehabilitation looks like it reduces mortality. So can we add rehabilitation to those therapies that we believe improve mortality and COPD? First of all, stop smoking, you live longer. If you need oxygen, uh, long-term oxygen therapy, makes you live longer. And now I think that we can add pulmonary rehabilitation. Not everybody accepts this, but I think the evidence is quite good. Is there even more? And this is hot off the presses uh, about six months ago. Uh, Peter Lindenauer published another study. And he looked in the same sort of, of group of Medicare patients and of the group that initiated pulmonary rehabilitation within 90 days of discharge and saw how many of them were readmitted to the hospital. How many of these people were left the hospital and then bounced back within uh, a, a certain period of time. And what he found is that in fact, the lower bar here is the people who receive rehabilitation versus not. And there was a 17% lower chance of being rehospitalized for COPD illness. Again, based on a very large database. So, more evidence 
of benefit of rehabilitation. So additional benefits, we've got those. Isn't that great? Well, what about the problem? Here is the, here is the, the problem. The problem, I had to search for a good word, abysmal participation in pulmonary rehabilitation. Just abysmal, terrible. How do I know this? Because uh, friends have published papers. This is Roger Goldstein from uh, Toronto, Canada, who did a survey of actually mostly non-United States people and found that if you take the number of people who get rehabilitation uh, divided by the number of people who have COPD in this case, only 1.2% of people with COPD can get rehabilitation. Another study from the United States uh, published a few years ago from Medicare eligible people uh, looked at Medicare's claims, claims, uh, claims data and found that, well, uh, in 2003, 2.6% of people who, um, had, who had COPD got rehabilitation. And, and by 2012, it had bounced way up to 3.7%. In other words, still terribly low numbers of people who would benefit, who get rehabilitation. Uh, another study from um, uh, Peter Lindenauer's group, again, looking at 2012 data, 223,000 people hospitalized for COPD. Uh, only 1.9% of them received rehabilitation within six months and 2.7% within 12 months, terribly low. And another paper from Lyndon Hour again, uh, 2014 data, 1.4% versus 3%. Just really, really ridiculously low numbers of people getting rehabilitation. And, 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 and the pandemic has made things even worse, even harder to get rehabilitation since a lot of us are staying home. Well, I don't, I don't wanna leave you with a depressing message. What is the way forward? How can we get more people to participate? And I think you might be interested in this. Uh, I've highlighted four different things that we have to address that each one incrementally would make things better. First of all, we have to let more people know about rehabilitation. And I'm not only talking about people who have COPD, I'm talking about physicians. I'm talking about insurers. I'm talking about legislators. We have to get better marketing to these people. This stuff is going on, uh, marketing to patients and providers. Uh, I can refer you to this website here. You might jot it down, livebetter.org. It was sort of created by a grant to the American Thoracic Society, livebetter.org. Talks about pulmonary rehabilitation. It's mostly for people who haven't had rehabilitation, but you might learn something by taking a look at this, livebetter.org, lovely website. Another one, I'm on the board of directors of, CO, of the COPD Foundation, uh, which is a, a fairly large organization that's a very strong advocacy group for COPD, copdfoundation.org. Uh, they have a lot of information, also a um, sort of a chat group with 50,000 members where you can uh, sort of interact with people and talk to people like me who have COPD. Uh, this is called 360, COPD 360 Social. Uh, another organization that I'm very close to my heart, I'm president of it, Mary Burns is, is the uh, founder. It comes out of the, uh, uh, the little company, Mary Program, uh, PERF, Pulmonary Education Research Foundation, have a very nice website, perfsecondwind.org, perf2ndwind.org. A lot of good stuff, a lot of archival stuff uh, of things that have been done way back in the past, but also uh, current things. There's a blog that you can sign up for. Uh, I think quite informative, but this is the kind of things that we need to educate people with COPD and, and similar diseases about, um, about pulmonary rehabilitation. How about insurers and regulators, the people who have the you know, control of the purse strings? Uh, this is Chris Garvey, uh, a good friend, a uh, good friend to uh, the uh, California um, medical scene. She's a nurse out of San Francisco, worked with her a long time. She initiated this last year to try to uh, enhance the um, profile of rehabilitation, got together 19 American organizations, all kinds of ver from, from very large to very small organizations, all signed on to this letter uh, to promote pulmonary rehabilitation. Notice it says, live better and live longer. And uh, one of the operant um, statements, 
patients suffering from COPD should know that pulmonary rehabilitation not only has the potential for help, helping them feel better and being more independent, but also to live longer. We're asking for your support in communicating these important findings and improve survival after pulmonary rehabilitation to providers and to patients. Important initiative. It comes along with this infographic. That's a great name for a piece of paper with uh, little uh, figures on it. Points out that rehabilitation is a third leading cause of death worldwide. 16 million people who have COPD in the United States, about another 15 million don't have it and don't know it that rehabilitation death rates are 37% lower after hospitalization with rehabilitation, but only three or 4% of Medicare beneficiaries receive pulmonary rehabilitation. Sort of a call to arms that we were distributing, hoping to get some traction. The next thing is increased reimbursement. Now, I must say that I have no idea how little Company of Mary provides pulmonary rehabilitation to Medicare beneficiaries with the amount of money they, they get for it. I honestly don't know. Um, these are figures that, um, that are, I think, current for Medicare reimbursement for uh, an hour of pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, notice it's $55, cardiac rehabilitation, one hour is $110. Why is cardiac rehabilitation twice as much? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. And is $55 a lot or a little? Well, actually it's, a, it's very, very little because you have to consider not only does it have to pay for the facility, for the staff that are there, for all the, the background and communication and scheduling, for the administrator upstairs, for the heat and electricity, for the medical director, $55 is a very low, low, low rate. And the rationale for it is unclear and we've been fighting to get this modified, but it's very difficult to budge the Medicare folks. Not only is uh, compared to cardiac rehabilitation, but compared to other things that you might get uh, medically that is reimbursed. You go for an echocardiogram, you know, put a probe in your chest and sort of see how your heart's functioning. That's four, $407, $409. A pulmonary function test, you walk in the lab and you know, 45 minutes later, you walk out with a pulmonary function. That's $229. Uh, even, I'm not sure these are well reimbursed, but certainly compared to rehabilitation, they're, they're uh, well reimbursed. How do we fix this? Lobbying, advocacy, uh, and again, these efforts are underway. Another thing is training pulmonary rehabilitation practitioners. Now, I know that Mary Burns was a, uh, an ICU nurse, and I can't remember what Jackie was when uh, Mary sort of snagged her and, and dragged her into rehabilitation, there aren't any, a, a good number of, of rehabilitation practitioner training programs. And we really need them. We need that, that, that cadre of people to deliver the service to make it effective. And then finally, are there alternate rehabilitation models that might make uh, it more accessible? And there's a lot of work under going on. And I have mixed feelings about this and I'll sort of express it. Uh, one is that you can do rehabilitation at home. And this has been a major focus of rehabilitation research in the last few years. I'll sort of, sort of give you my, my, my thoughts on, on the concept. First of all, there's a bunch of papers that have been published in good journals, home-based rehabilitation for COPD using minimal resources, a randomized controlled equivalence trial. Uh, another one here, 2018, long-term efficacy is did it work of um, community-based exercise intervention uh, where they had people walking in the community and urban communities to incre increase physical activity in COPD. Again, not, not in a center at home. Uh, supervised pulmonary tele-rehabilitation using uh, Zoom or similar things, phones versus pulmonary rehabilitation in centers in severe COPD, a randomized multi-center trial. And then finally, this sort of provocatively uh, titled paper pulmonary rehabilitation in a post-COVID-19 world, telerehabilitation as a new standard for patients with COPD. Ha, huh, interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is interesting indeed. But I, I, we have to acknowledge that a lot of these re home rehabilitation programs, well, they, they're, they're not the same. They're not all the same. And they sort of vary. And, and some are where they say, you know, sign up for our web 
our web program and you can come to the web and uh, download information and watch little videos and there's not really any contact with rehabilitation professionals that's sort of one end of the spectrum and the other end of a home program are where you have a rehabilitation team that's not in the home but communicates very intensively with the person as they're un undergoing rehabilitation that you might have an in-person in person pre and post intervention evaluation for safety and things like that and is, is doing all these exercises at home safe well i'm not sure uh and also that they conduct rehabilitation sessions uh over zoom where you might have uh four or four or six people you know on a zoom screen and the rehabilitation professional in, on, on one of the uh, windows and everybody's watching each other and interacting well that's a lot different than just saying <clears throat> here's your website and go and do it yourself so we have to say what we're talking about when we talk about home rehabilitation. I published this, uh, it was an editorial a couple of years ago, uh, whether, uh, where is pulmonary rehabilitation going? Will these alternate modes hurt or help? And I made the case that considering these home programs equivalent doesn't seem to be quite plausible, at least to me, because most people who have had had a progressive illness uh, like COPD, they get used to being sedentary. You know, when you, when you, it's perfectly understandable that people who have shortness of breath when they move around, stop moving around. And that's hard to reverse when it's going on for a long period of time. And I think you need sustained efforts of professionals who are trained in getting people moving. And also that you work with people who are, have similar problems in a group and I think that helps you, encourage you. And with that, at home, you can't get these things. And I think there's a final danger that if the payers, you know, people who pay for these programs say, well, I can do this, let's this be done at home and it's gonna cost me nothing or near next to nothing. Well, let, let's do that. Well, hell, hell, why not? Why do this in inpatient, uh, in-center programs that are more expensive? So we may disincentivize the in-center programs. Well, this isn't the end of the story. There's more to come on this, and it's a, an evolving state. I think it's one of the action items of rehabilitation to try to figure out where home programs belong. Uh, I must say that my, my heart is in the uh, in-center programs uh, that I believe are, are so effective. Um, well, so I think I've reached the end of uh, my time. I have this at the end of my time. Eh, not, not, not too bad. Um, talked about the sort of history of rehabilitation, the additional benefits that we might expect, including mortality, the fact that we're not rehabilitating enough people, and uh, perhaps some ways forward where things will get better in, in future years. I thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. Dr. Cassaberry, so yeah. outstanding. Thank well, you.